questions from each of the stakeholders to determine whether or not whether or not these um, the CEO of, of Zilk Soy Milk is meeting our needs and meeting the needs of the people in our communities and the needs of you know other women things or if they are in fact guilty of green capitalism. So um guilty of green capitalism is it that's a crime. I thought that's what we're all supposed to be sorry. <laughs> so um please please hold your tongue until until you're dressed directly by the way. So let's let's start. We can just go take one question from each group going around in this direction. And um Zilk, I'm sure we'll field these questions truthfully, as we are in a court of law. Um so let's hear from our urban community residents over here. Oh yeah. Um you can also like tell us just who you are and um kind of like explaining where you're coming from and then give a question to our CEO. Well, we are the urban neighborhood residents and we are losing our homes to richer younger people who are able to pay rent and we're we're losing our like sense of diversity and like our sense of home, you know? And these supermarkets are coming in with these coming in with these Whole Foods and um, where there's your Zilk soy milk and <laughs> and it's supposed to be green and good, but it's not good because we can't afford it ourselves. We can't do anything with it. It's it's not helping us at all. So my question to you is, what good and what greenness are you providing for us when we can't even provide for ourselves? Silk? So 
but what I really want to know is, uh, what does ethical mean to you? What, what does ethically produced mean? We are not required to uh, publicize our standards. <laughs> <laughs> there's like it's complex and we try to do the best we can for all the different parties we have the workers we have the environment we have the consumers we have our share of the stakeholders and shareholders and we want to do find the, the middle point that does the best for everybody you know in combination honest truth so the most ethical outcome is what we can do to do that and you're doing that <laughs> <laughs> and a question from um, Silk Corporation workers. Um, how can we say that our company is green when we are using all these pesticides on the soy plants? And also, how can you reduce or eliminate the injury of us workers per hearing loss and other injuries in the company? Before we hear from Silk, can you just tell us a little bit about your experience as workers? Um, the machinery to make the packaging is um, making a lot of us have hearing loss. The floors are slippery. It's an unsafe environment for workers. Um, we're being exposed to chemicals daily spraying soy plants as our consumers buying Zilk soy milk and the packaging is not green. What can you say, Zilk? Can you say your question again? Um, how can you say the company is green when we're using all these chemicals for packaging and pesticides to spray plants? And how can you reduce the injuries of your workers? Green is a spectrum. <laughs> 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 We're purchasing renewable energy credits for all of the energy that we are using. So anything that's happening in the factories, we are uh, doing well by them in the end. Well, the kind of credits you've been purchasing so far won't be eligible. In fact, you might have to uh, pay them back because um, they were they were built on uh, land that didn't meet international standards for um, for energy credits because it was um, <laughs> taken from taken unfairly from indigenous peoples. And what do energy? Just wait for the other side. Well, you're purchasing energy credits, not hearing gain credits. Are you paying for cochlear implants or or just making windmills for them? <laughs> we there with the pump insurance. I want to go back so um, all the parties get a chance to respond. So we did already hear from the indigenous and campesinos for their second turn. So um, let's hear from the urban community residents one more time. So uh, one of your response was that the, you don't have an obligation to invest in the community. Right? Um, but then you get tax breaks from the government, and then you earn profit from what we pay. Profit equals raw wages, right? We produce, and the value of the product is denied to us because you take away in terms of profit, right? So what you call profit is our own wages, the value that we create. Now we are refusing to invest that. Well, that's an obligation, right? We invest in our customer base, but you, as you all said, we're not our customer base. We, like the people who are moving into your neighborhood and buying our milk are our customer base, and we're very grateful for that. <laughs> Let's hear from the consumers one more time if you have a response. Um, so, one, one thing that I'd like to know is, uh, is does, does the equation balance out? So you say that you invest uh, all, what for every, for every kilowatt hour of electricity that you use, um, you buy a renewable energy credit, so does that balance out. Are you are you investing as much in renewable energy, and is that offsetting what you are actually?
producing or what, it, what you're actually using up of your energy? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the safety of us workers and consumers and um, help us financially, I guess, ensure our jobs. Well, by getting as much profit as we possibly can, we are making our company stronger and ensuring your jobs for the rest of your life. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Bill, for being on Hot Seats. And thanks, everybody, for being awesome. Um, when you said it's been just a part of your system. I guess we wanted to do a little bit of a debrief um, of this, uh, which I guess Shane is going to be facilitating for us. Okay. So, obviously,
to the market's advantage to that these people remain as ignorant as possible. And to do that, they obfuscate by using buzzwords um, that are culturally appropriated for the marketing of a good, and then you know bring connotations, emotional connotations, and, and ecological and political connotations that people don't think twice about. And if they did, then they might change their spending habits. Um, for me, it seems spontaneous, but also maybe very intentional in the way that um, the system has divided us to all of us in different spheres. So we are totally, we don't know what's going on with the indigenous or with the producers, with the employees, or, you know, we, are the cons we were the consumers here, but we didn't know, I mean, we didn't have the whole picture about what was happening in the factory or the stakeholders. So it seems like, a, you know, maybe this is like a small case, but at the same time, it, it, it's, uh, it reflects what's happening in all over the system that we don't see beyond our neighborhood, our region, uh, or even less the, the whole planet, you know. So it seems like it is like a divide and conquer. We are very divided, and uh, if we, but if we have an opportunity to come together. We can see the other pieces, and it was very shocking or to to learn that about the other the rest of the pieces. I think like the consumers, they don't like they they wouldn't. A lot of them may not even want to give up their their product. The Zilk milk, which is convenient, and the Whole Foods is convenient. And, you know, you know, maybe if they knew <clears throat> the levels that it affected all the different you know prongs, that it, it, it's a multi pronged thing. It took away the land from the indigenous people. It's taking away the land from. Um, the urban people, you know, and they're just like, oh, it's a great product and it's green and yay, you know, and, and you know, and that's really how it is. Like, you know, they, they, and they think they're doing a service to the environment, to society by buying this green product, which really isn't green, you know, and they're just kind of like what Joe said, they're just, um, I don't know, numb or, or dumb to the effect that it's not, it's affecting so many different levels in a bad way, you know, and they think they're doing something good, but they're, it's doing bad in a lot of different ways, you know. Does that make sense? I, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just want to respond to that with what Danielle, um, Danielle, Danielle, Danielle was saying is that like the information that we were given is, was all positive. You know, and the we, we had a complete disconnect from all the other parties that were affected by this. Right. And so all you know, all the, the where we were getting our news from was, you know, hey, they um, they're ethically sourced. They they, you know, invest in these renewable energy resources, and they, they, I mean, they, they listed off what they invested in, and um, they're social, they're socially responsible, and yeah. So like, it's it what Joe was saying. It's all these buzzwords, um, and it's it's the way that we were we were able to tackle those those bigger things, right? Like that's that's how we were able to organize it in our heads to kind of understand it, you know, because maybe we don't. We just don't really understand um, what else would go into a socially responsible consumer. Well, I think it's important to define, you know, sort of, we ha there has to be an agreement with what is socially responsible. It has to be an agreement. This is somebody saying, we are this, and uh, abiding by their own created rules and regulations, or, or lack thereof. So therefore, when you don't have all the stakeholders at the table, then you can do whatever you want and say, yeah, this falls under the parameters of socially responsible. So, I mean, we're definitely, you know, uh, I was part of the indigenous group over there, and so we're definitely talking a lot about uh, the systems of oppression that, um, you know, took the land from us. We didn't have a whole lot of choice um, or voice in that. Um, but one thing that I, I always try to, um, put on put on the positive is instead of putting on a or looking through the lens of being a victim, um, identifying as many options and choices that we can make, and so for like the urban population that um, you know is concerned about the gentrification of their neighborhood, they can't afford you know this silk product that the con consumers love, um, having an op option in Worcester like the um, artichoke, right? So they have the collective buying power, buy in bulk, and so maybe buying in bulk, the urban population could have access to the fine Zilk product that 
you guys like at the retail price, right? But the urban population could enjoy it at the wholesale price if they, right, get collected together. And so, you know, w with all the different challenges, um, um, you know, for the workers, uni unionizing, you know, having uh, one voice, the collective bargaining power, and, you know, really looking at as many options and ways that recognizing how many choices we have. Because when we just put on a victim mentality and, you know, point the finger, that's just going to contribute to this blame cycle and, and, you know, negative circle around, um, you know, what we're trying to resolve. And so if we try and resolve, um, you know, a, you know, poor working conditions by, you know, blaming and um, anything like that, then we're just going to perpetuate that cycle of negativity. And so just trying to put on, you know, identify those positives that we can do, you know, the positive of the collective bargaining power, the positive of, you know, coming together as a co-op, the, co the power of coming together as a local indigenous population, having one voice. And so instead of just some scattered voices, there's, you know, one larger voice coming out of you know, this, um, you know, South American country. I think this, what you're getting at gets at a lot of things about, you know, there's these ways of collectively organizing, but it also gets at, like, the larger indictment of green capitalism, not just one corporation or this idea of corporate accountability that, like, the consumers could say, oh, I just found out about all these groups organizing against silk, and could shift their money somewhere else. That's not going to change the exploitation felt there, 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 there. And like, the union organizing as a union has a limit on what they can even ask for. At a certain point, that falls apart, or they're asking for things greater than capitalism can give them. And like, the indigenous peoples who've lost their land, yes, they can collectively organize. What are they asking for? Their land back. So where is silk gonna go in a alternate solidarity green economy? They might not exist. Mm -hmm. So like, what really breaks here isn't like like a cycle of negativity so much as capitalism, like and the idea. I mean, it seems to me, and um, unfortunately, I, I would be saying this had it even had not been in the CEO group, but like the break is between an absolute ethics and a utilitarian ethics. So all the other groups are coming kind of from a position of absolute ethics. You know, uh, the indigenous have an absolute right to this land, or the workers have an absolute right to working in a safe environment. Um, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And then the, the capitalist, you know, the CEO or the company has this utilitarian. It, it has to be utilitarian about what they can and cannot do, and, and provide that greatest good to as many people. And I, that seems to be like the caricature or the debate that gets played out every every single day. So, and I don't. We've got to figure out how to get beyond that or break through that caricature. Um, because as it's played out, you know, can can we say that the utilitarian approach is absolutely wrong? And then what then can replace that? Because all of those absolute ethics may may be in conflict with each other, at least as the system is right now. We're gonna take one more comment and then we're gonna move to closing out the workshop. Your point about the utilitarianism is what I run into is we let the we let the companies and let the people power make those utilitarian decisions. We we let the and instead of you know having a real discussion between all the affected parties and frank and and uh, really it's, it's the company they're not just saying they're making an abstract utilitarian utilitarian what's best for everyone. It's, they're actually in reality they're thinking. How much money can I make? Even a socially responsible cookbook company, they're just using socially responsible as a brand, it makes sense. Uh, they're using it at, because because you can get make money off social responsibility. Uh, so they need about and they and as a capitalist company, they need to balance that against making lots of profits for their shareholders. 
And this is why are we letting this utilitarian decision making be made by someone with an obvious bias instead of all working out amongst ourselves as a society. We, I mean, and even though when there are conflicts with people, don't necessarily want to just screw people aimlessly. You know, the the, 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 the worker at the factory may not want to screw their neighbor, the consumer, though in this situation they want, or they, and they don't want to gentrify the neighborhood they might actually live in themselves. And the people in the neighborhood themselves might say we don't want to necessarily, you know, again, like we might actually work ourselves and find better commonalities than if we ask, a, you know, a government or a capital organization to say, okay, we'll work it out for you, because they're not going to do that in reality. So I think those last comments brought up some really great points that'll segue nice into our next activity. Yeah. Because really what we're getting at is it's not just about one corporation, it's not just about corporations in general. We're talking about an economy and what what causes it to function, what is it fueled off of, and what are the motivations that are driving our economy right now. So um, we're just gonna come back to the trees right now.